Hi, it's Katrina. New Egyptian Mummy The discovery of a new Egyptian mummy could just be rewriting history. In 2019, archaeologists discovered the mummified body of a nobleman from ancient Egypt to be much older than previously thought. The nobleman is called Kui, and they have dated his remains back to the days of the Old Kingdom, about 1,000 years earlier than researchers had reported. This makes Kui one of the oldest mummies ever uncovered. It changes history for one primary reason. It shows evidence that the Egyptians were using advanced embalming techniques over 1,000 years before previously assumed. This nobleman was mummified 4,000 years ago, and it was done with shocking sophistication. The process, the materials that were used, the quality of the resin, and the linen dressing, it was all ahead of their time. According to Professor Salima Ikram, the head of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo, historians must revise every single book about mummification and the history of Egypt's Old Kingdom. All the dates need to be changed. Until now, researchers thought mummification during the days of the Old Kingdom was a simple process – basic dehydration and frequently unsuccessful removal of the brain. Not to mention more detail given to the appearance of the mummy than the actual science behind the process. But that's not true. It must have been that poorer people closer to the bottom of the social ladder had bad mummifications, while the richest in society had the knowledge to do things the right way. Vikings in the New World A shocking recent discovery has changed everything we understand about Vikings in the New World. Researchers in Canada have finally found a second Viking settlement in North America. It's close to the first one at Lansau Meadows, just a few miles away at a place called Point Rosé. It's a small peninsula that stretches off the southern tip of Newfoundland and into the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. Researchers here discovered a stone hearth that Vikings had once used for working iron. Those same Vikings built their first settlement on the northern tip of Newfoundland. But just what exactly was happening here 1,000 years ago? It's all become quite confusing with this newest discovery. We know the first settlement at Lansau Meadows was temporary. It was more of a way station that was abandoned by the Vikings after a couple of years. But this newest place at Point Rosé shows evidence of a longer habitation. Plus, it's on the other side of the island. It would have taken a significant amount of time and effort to journey from the first site to the second site. Sadly, there's not much remaining in the way of archaeological evidence. But if they prove the discovery legitimate, and this was another Viking site, there could be even more such sites spread across the North Atlantic. The Origin of Man The analysis of a fossil belonging to a species of hominin known as El Greco has flipped everything we know about the evolution of mankind on its head. The analysis of the fossils, which belong to a type of early human which arose in the Mediterranean part of Europe, suggests humans didn't emerge in Africa. They may have started in Europe, then moved into Africa. If true, every history book in the world will need to be rewritten. Because until now, just about every scientist and historian in the world has agreed that human life started in Africa. The predominant theory has always been that a small group of hominids evolved in Africa, then dispersed through the rest of the world to become Denisovans and Neanderthals, and eventually humans. But looking at the tooth and lower jawbone of the El Greco fossils, archaeologists have thrown the Africa theory out the window. Archaeologists found these fossils in Bulgaria, and these bones belong to the oldest, pre-human, ape-like creature ever identified. And if it was living in Europe, that means it was there over 4 million years earlier than any similar human-like creature discovered in Africa. Friendship Ornaments Friendship is not a modern invention. 6,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer communities in the northeast of Europe weren't just a bunch of primitive cave people. They were humans with emotions and friends. A recently discovered Stone Age artifact has proven beyond any doubt just how important friendship was to this group of people. Scientists believed for a long time they were nothing but bird-brained troglodytes. But throughout Finland and near the Lake Onega region in Russia, Archaeologists have been digging up broken pendants. These people made broken pendants or ornaments from slate rings. Researchers simply thought they were lost and buried for thousands of years. 
But a recent study by scientists at the University of Helsinki has proved something different. People broke these ornaments on purpose and smashed them into fragments to be used as Stone Age friendship necklaces. I'm talking about matching necklaces that, when put together, form a heart-shaped pendant. You know, the BFF style of necklace. Picture this in your head, except 6,000 years ago. These Stone Age people broke the larger ornaments on purpose, then fashioned each half into a necklace to be worn by a pair of long-distance friends. Researchers know this because they found two matching fragments at two different locations, meaning a different person wore each piece. They found the same thing multiple times, proving it wasn't a fluke. It seems nomadic ancient people, even though they lived a vagabond nomadic lifestyle, still kept reminders of their friends in faraway places. Did you use a friendship necklace or a bracelet? Let me know in the comments below. The Lost City of Atlantis The confirmed discovery of the lost city of Atlantis would flip the world upside down. People have been searching for Atlantis for so long that finding it today would be like finding Godzilla sleeping in the ocean somewhere. How close is Plato's story to real history? It seems researchers are getting closer to the Atlantis mystery. After years of research, and with the help of satellite technology, researcher Christos A. Jonis has revealed the most likely prehistoric setting for Atlantis, an actual place currently 400 feet underwater. It's called the Cyclades Plateau, and in the year 9600 BC, it was a super island off the coast of mainland Greece. What's fascinating about the plateau is that it corresponds to the time when Plato described Atlantis. To Plato, Atlantis went extinct roughly 11,000 years ago, a very long time ago. That was just around the end of the last ice age. The Greek islands that we know about today, like Mykonos and Santorini, were mountainous parts of the Cyclades Plateau. But after monumental flooding around 8,000 BC, the islands we see now are the only parts of the larger plateau still sticking out of the water. The point of this whole thing is that Atlantis was right there off the coast of Athens. All the small islands of the Aegean Sea were once part of a solid landmass that was likely called Atlantis. And when it flooded, it became broken up into tiny islands. If the water level ever drops 400 feet, the island of Atlantis will once more be visible as a whole. If this theory of Atlantis is true, how do you think Plato could have known about a flood that happened 8,000 years before he lived? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Romans in Canada A shipwreck in Nova Scotia, Canada has revealed some unique evidence that suggests the Romans were the first people to discover North America. This would rewrite history in a lot of ways. Not only would it rewrite the original rewrite of the Vikings discovering North America, but it would show the Romans were more sea-savvy than anyone had realized. The biggest piece of evidence for this comes from a Roman sword, a piece of ancient treasure fished out of the ocean while a man and his son were hunting scallops off the coast. But they never told anyone about the discovery, because in Nova Scotia, the government owns all the shipwrecks and any treasure discovered belonging to one so they kept this sword a secret for decades. It wasn't until after the man died that he passed the sword down to his daughter, and then it was her husband who finally alerted some archaeological authorities. According to researcher J. Hutton Pulitzer, the Roman sword is authentic. A test showed it is made of the same ore as Roman swords, but no one has ever found the shipwreck it came out of. There are a lot of shipwrecks scattered around the coast here, and almost nobody is investigating them. But that doesn't change the fact that a man and his son found a sword from ancient Rome in the waters of Canada. Maybe a Roman brought it to Canadian shores, or someone took the sword from a Roman. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The Mungo Man The Mungo Man was discovered by geologist Jim Bowler in New South Wales in 1974. The Mungo Man's bones proved to be the oldest remains of any indigenous Australian in the country. Archaeologists dated them at 40,000 years old, and they immediately changed the history of Australia. These bones are still the oldest Homo sapiens remains ever found on the continent of Australia. This was a shocking revelation in the 1970s because it proved definitively that the indigenous peoples, the native Australian groups, 
were the first to live on the land. To give you an idea of how important this timescale is, the indigenous people of Australia were present on the island for about four times longer than Native Americans in North America. The dating of the Mungo Man skeleton proved that when Native Americans were first migrating to North America, people had already been living in Australia for 30,000 years. This discovery changed the modern European ideas of what Australia is, reforming the nation's known history. Very short farmers. A shocking new discovery says that when human beings stopped hunting and gathering and started farming, it had extremely negative health side effects. A recent study combined genetics and skeletal remains to prove that 12,000 years ago in Europe, the earliest farmers were extremely short. Researchers from Penn State wanted to see what happened when humans stopped moving around, gave up hunting, and became sedentary farmers. They thought a good way to do this was to look at the height of ancient people around the same time period. So, about 40 international researchers got together and looked at the heights of people who lived before and after the Neolithic era, until the Iron Ages. The result of this in-depth study was a graph of heights from 38,000 to 2,400 years ago. We can now see the height of Europeans from the days of mammoth hunters to the time of farmers. And what we see is that the first farmers were approximately 1.5 inches shorter on average than previous humans. But as time continued, people once more got taller. They got taller in the Copper Age, a little more in the Bronze Age, and back up to pre-agricultural human height after the Iron Age. Something happened when we started farming that made us short. The issue right now is that scientists don't know what that was. The Oldest Fossil Scientists have discovered what they say could be the oldest fossil on the planet. This ancient fossil is 3.75 billion years old, and it could rewrite everything we know about life on this planet. They made the discovery in Quebec, Canada. Associate Professor in Astrobiology at the University College London, Dominic Papineau, found the fossil while on an expedition in 2008. But it wasn't until 2017 that he published his findings. He discovered tiny fibers of bacteria left behind in ordinary rocks. That means the bacteria were alive and thriving at the time the fossil was made. This means they existed much earlier. The study says the bacteria could have been around 4.2 billion years ago, even though scientists agree that that would be impossible. Nobody believed life could have existed on the primordial Earth, not at the very beginning of our planet's formation. Scientists thought it took around a billion years for life to finally kick off in any meaningful way. But this bacteria proves otherwise. Now it looks like there were diverse microbial ecosystems at the very beginning of the planet's formation, or at least soon after. What this means for the rest of the universe is shocking. If there was life on primordial Earth, a place as inhospitable as Mars, there could be microbial life on every other planet in the solar system. Or at least there could have been, billions of years ago, the Roundels. Archaeologists recently discovered structures even older than the Egyptian pyramids in Central Europe, and nobody is sure who put them there. These structures are called roundels, and they are found in Czech. The structures are circular ditches, primitive Neolithic fortifications around what was probably once a modest settlement. They were built around 4800 BC. But then they were abandoned about 200 years later in 4600 BC. The huge mystery is that scientists can't exactly figure out why. What they know is that researchers have found other similar fortifications across Europe. This exact style, the central settlement surrounded by ditches and fortified walls, was used for about 300 years before completely vanishing. Experts believe roundels were a kind of blip in history, an idea that worked well for a while but then was abandoned because society changed. We don't know what that change was, but it was big enough that it changed history. Newer, more complex settlements were made, and human beings started advancing. What's weird is that it happened so quickly. It almost seems like some unknown event caused this dramatic switch from primitive living to megalithic city building. The Alien Gods of Egypt Aliens have invaded ancient history wherever you go. 
Ancient Egypt as we think of it began about 5,000 years ago, and it is hard for many to believe that people were so advanced during that time. At ancient sites, archaeologists have found ramp systems, post holes, and inscriptions detailing how the ancient pharaohs built their impressive structures. Ancient Egypt was one of the most advanced societies on the planet, but how did they move such heavy blocks such long distances, and why did they worship such strange gods? The more exciting fringe theory is that it was because they had help from aliens. Since the late 19th century, this theory has gained traction when science fiction authors started including it in their work. Every ancient society worshipped some kind of pantheon of mysterious gods, from the Assyrians worshipping the Anunnaki to the Greeks worshipping the gods of Mount Olympus. But the Egyptian deities were slightly more extraterrestrial than the others. The show Ancient Aliens has greatly helped make this theory more popular. As Rice Thomas pointed out in a Vice article, when the mystery is as big as the Great Pyramid of Giza, which has been around for thousands of years and is still standing, it's easy to see why. There is also the case of the famous pharaoh Akhenaten from the 14th century BC. He is depicted with large eyes, an enormous cone skull, skinny arms and legs, and an odd protruding tummy. His appearance has made many question if he actually was an alien. It appears as though pharaoh Akhenaten had a genetic mutation which caused his brain to grow far larger than normal, and for some strange reason, he got rid of all the Egyptian gods and declared there was only one. Many other pharaohs and members of the royal family appear to have long, elongated skulls and large eyes, probably from cranial deformation, but to some, they are proof of visitors from another world. The Knights Templar and Friday the 13th If you ever wondered why Friday the 13th is such a terrifying day, it actually goes back thousands and thousands of years. In fact, there is a hidden truth behind the Friday the 13th phenomenon that has to do with an ancient legal document, the Sumerians, and the Knights Templar. One theory is that the Code of Hammurabi, which is considered to be the oldest legal document in the world, superstitiously omitted the 13th rule from its list, starting the trend over 2,000 years before today. Others say the paranoia around the 13th comes from the Sumerians, who thought the number 12 was perfect and the number 13 was evil. But by far the most interesting theory perhaps has to do with the Knights Templar and their destruction. It was in 1118 that they began life as a monastic military order. Their first task was to protect pilgrims who traveled to the Holy Land, but they quickly became one of the most influential groups of the Middle Ages. They grew very rich after the Crusades and had their own castles, churches, and established their own banks. Their downfall came early in the morning on Friday, October 13, 1307. Around 600 Templars were arrested. They were charged with heresy and devil worship. Pretty much all of them were brutally tortured or burned by medieval inquisitors. It is said that the very date of the destruction of the Knights Templar has stuck in human memory ever since, transformed into the evilest day on the calendar. The Nazca Lines of Kazakhstan you are probably already familiar with the Nazca Lines, but what a lot of people don't know is that across the entire globe, from South America to Central Asia, there is a group of giant geoglyphs almost exactly like the ones in Peru. These are the Kazakhstan geoglyphs, and over 50 of them have been discovered in northern Kazakhstan thanks to satellite images. Nobody is exactly sure what these geoglyphs mean, although some of these shapes have proved to be pretty disturbing. For example, Researchers have identified a massive swastika scraped into the ground. It seems to be nearly 1,300 feet in diameter, and it's accompanied by plenty of other geometric shapes, things like crosses, rings, and squares. Some of these geoglyphs are bigger than modern aircraft carriers. The swastika pattern may sound bad, but it's not what you think. These symbols were actually used in ancient times as a symbol of peace and balance. It's also a little different than the one from the 30s. However, we're not really sure how old the symbols are here. They were definitely left behind by an ancient society probably thousands of years ago, but nobody has come up with an exact date. We also don't know why they were made. The symbols could have been markers where rituals took place. They may have been used to mark ownership of the land. It's completely up in the air, and researchers are stumped. The Pyramid of Argentina Cono de Arita is the Great Pyramid of Argentina, depending on who you ask. 
This large sandy triangle is situated in the middle of an inhospitable wasteland, a place called Salar de Arizaro. The pyramid stands over 400 feet above the Sea of Salt. The only way to reach the pyramid is by descending through the high Andes, crossing the deadly salt flats to reach the end of the world in this Patagonian landscape. The mystery with the pyramid is that nobody can say for sure if this was ever actually a real pyramid or if it's just a natural geological formation. Scientists say it's nothing but a volcano sitting dormant on the salt flats. However, others say this was indeed a pyramid constructed by some kind of ancient civilization that lived in this part of Argentina thousands of years before the Inca ever ruled Peru in the north. And while there isn't actually any archaeological evidence to suggest an unknown race of people really did live here, it's not impossible. Even if Cono de Arita is nothing but a pyramid-shaped mound of sand, it still may have been the epicenter for ceremonial activities in the region. It's the most striking geological feature for thousands of miles in any direction. Any society who learned of its whereabouts would surely have made pilgrimages here to be closer to the gods. It's just that all traces of potential human activity have been wiped away by the desert sands and the thousands of years. Shout out time! Big thank you to Kaiser Sos and Jessica Tyree, who is a longtime subscriber. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Persecuting Weevils In the 16th century, an insect was put on trial. In the year 1545, a group of winemakers from a small village in the Rhone Alps in France did something that's very hard to believe. They took some bugs to court. They placed a complaint through a legal representative that a species of weevil was destroying their vineyards. A weevil is a type of insect that you may have spotted in your flour or rice. Many of them have long snouts and they love to eat people's food. But they actually are not that harmful. Not that anyone knew that in the 16th century. The winemakers needed somebody to blame for the damage to their crops. Thankfully for the weevils, the court refused to pass any kind of sentence on them and instead issued a proclamation the following year in 1546 that the winemakers say a public prayer. This was the theologically appropriate outcome to the trial, rather than hunting down and killing all the weevils. But the courts didn't finish up that quickly. They went and dragged the entire town into the situation. In order to serve some divine vengeance against the weevils, the entire town was ordered to repent for their sins pay their tithes, celebrate three high masses, and then to march in solidarity around the vineyards as if the weevils were some sort of plague sent by God. After all, it was the townspeople's sins in the first place that led to this evil. The public was a little surprised at this judgment since they already considered themselves to be church-going citizens. Later on, the weevils were taken to trial again, and this time they were excommunicated in exchange for receiving a piece of land. It's unclear whether they accepted the deal. Why was the church taking these cases in the first place? It's hard to say. Buried alive. A terrifying revelation has been made thanks to some bizarre burials found in a group of Chinese tombs. These tombs date back 3,000 years and belong to a wealthy clan from the Shang Dynasty. The complex of tombs was uncovered at the ancient city of Anyang in China's Henan province. There are ruins here from one of the first major cities that ever sprang up in China, called Yin. It was the capital from around 1600 BC until 1046 BC. But the real forbidden history comes from what's under the city, in the 24 extravagant graves that have just been excavated. The graves held the remains of warriors and war horses, humans and animals that appear to have been sacrificed at the funerals of their wealthy patrons. It seems like they may have been buried alive to accompany the richest dead people in society into the afterlife. Inside the tombs, there were war chariots, the remains of the horses that pulled them, and warriors dressed in fancy clothes. Some of the warriors were found wearing hats which had been decorated with strings of shells. The foreheads of the horses had been covered in gold veneer. Everything looked like it had been part of some great ceremony for the dead. According to Kong Deming, the director of the local Institute of Cultural Relics, this is a very rare discovery in the ancient city. The ritualistic killing of the servants and warriors shows just how incredibly powerful the masters were and how they lorded over society, ignoring the Torah. A new study of ancient fish bones has proven that Judeans didn't always take the Torah quite as seriously as most people may have thought. In fact, Jewish people of ancient Israel may have completely ignored the Torah and ate non-kosher fish 
even though it was prohibited. Researchers recently looked at fish bones found at 30 different archaeological sites across Israel and Sinai. These bones date back over 2,000 years and cover a period of time from the Late Bronze Age to the Byzantine period. The overwhelming evidence shows that Judeans ate pretty much all the fish they wanted, even though the Torah prohibited them from eating finless and scaleless fish. The issue here is that the Torah was written at a lot of different times. The writing of this text started way before the destruction of Jerusalem, probably around 586 BC, and writing continued all the way up until the more modern times of Hellenistic Greece. There are two passages which forbid eating any kind of species of fish that lacks scales or fins, but it never really says why. This rule probably came about because of something that was happening in society over 2,500 years ago, but has been lost to time. Archaeological evidence shows that Judeans continued to eat whatever kind of fish they wanted anyway, right up until the Roman era, when non-kosher fish bones suddenly became absent from all Judean settlements. Even though the rule was around for hundreds of years before, the Judeans never really bothered with it. Not until the Romans came around, and nobody has any idea why. Jack the Giant Killer The tale of Jack and the Beanstalk is significantly older than most people realize, and actually has ties to a legend of giants that may have lived thousands of years ago. The English fairy tale we're familiar with these days, the one with the giant that goes fee fi fo fum is an alteration of an 18th century story about Jack the Giant Killer, and the origins of that story can be traced through the oral histories of prehistoric England, way beyond modern times to thousands of years ago when a race of giants allegedly occupied the British Isles. According to Raphael Hollinshed, who wrote a 16th century chronicle of England, Scotland, and Ireland, Britain's oldest name on record is Albion, that name can be traced to a prehistoric king who ruled a race of giants over 5,000 years ago. It sounds strange, but it might be more rooted in reality than most people want to believe. Marco Polo wrote that he encountered giants when he traveled to Zanzibar. The Bible is filled with stories of Middle Eastern giants. The journalist Glenn D. Kittler allegedly encountered men who were 8 feet tall when he journeyed deep into the Congo in the 20th century. These kinds of accounts come from all over the world since the beginning of time. These giants may have actually come from a very distinct subspecies of Homo sapiens. This is based on a skeleton that was discovered in a Siberian cave over a decade ago. This skeleton, a unique kind of humanoid called a Denisovan, lived 50,000 years ago and was way taller than other man-like species. It's possible that the descendants of these extremely tall, primitive people could have wandered all the way into North America, then slowly went extinct. The Thule Papyrus The Thule Papyrus is an ancient Egyptian document from the rule of Tutmos III. The ancient papyrus first gained notoriety in 1953, when Tiffany Thayer wrote of the artifact in Fortean Society magazine. The papyrus was supposedly discovered among the loose papers of a deceased Vatican Museum director by the name of Alberto Tulli. Within the papyrus is the description of a UFO sighting from thousands of years ago. The document supposedly goes into great description about circles of fire and giant red disks that came out of the sky, but nobody knows if this document is actually real. This is one of the most controversial ancient Egyptian documents that's out there. The first issue is that nobody believes the translation. Pretty much all mainstream scientists have called this thing a hoax and pure nonsense. The papyrus almost definitely exists, it's just the translation that's controversial. But if it's true, as it very well could be, that makes the document the oldest known confirmation of an alien visitor to our planet. Ancient Secrets When people wanted to pass secrets along in the olden days, they didn't have coded text messages and secret folders to hide their stuff. Instead, they used a very sneaky technique called letter locking to keep all their forbidden texts hidden from prying eyes. Sending letters centuries ago was quite an affair. A piece of paper didn't go into an envelope and get dumped into a postal receptacle. Instead, they just used letter locking. This was the process of making extremely specific folds and cuts in a piece of paper so that it would seal itself shut. It was almost like medieval origami, something anyone could do to protect their darkest secrets. 
When a letter was sent that was locked together using its own folds and flaps, there was no way somebody could sneak a peek. Not unless they undid all the folds, which would leave obvious evidence of tampering. And back then, no mail delivery person would dare do such a thing because it would ruin their reputation and they would never get work again. This earliest form of encryption probably began in the 1200s in Europe and continued to be used to keep documents, love letters, and death threats safe up until it started falling out of favor in the 18th century. The Mystery Monoliths In November 2020, a mysterious metal monolith showed up in Utah. A monolith is a large, single, upright pillar, usually made of stone. It was discovered by state officials, who at the time had been counting sheep from a helicopter. It was completely bizarre and looked an awful lot like the strange monolith from Stanley Kubrick's cult classic, 2001, A Space Odyssey. In the movie, the monolith is placed on the planet by extraterrestrials to jumpstart human evolution. But with the Utah monolith, it didn't appear to spark anything. It was in the middle of nowhere. Within a week, the monolith became a massive tourist attraction. Internet investigators used Google Earth to pinpoint its exact location and learned it had likely been sitting there since 2015. For over five years, the monolith probably sat in the desert and no one ever noticed it. And yet the moment it was swarmed by tourists, it vanished. A second monolith appeared in Romania. Days after, it was gone. At the start of December 2020, a third monolith was discovered in California at the peak of a hiking path on Pine Mountain. Within a short amount of time, a fourth monolith appeared in Pittsburgh and a fifth in Las Vegas. The one in Pittsburgh was just a publicity stunt by the owner of a shop to get more people to buy candy. But finally, a sixth monolith was discovered in the Netherlands on December 6, 2020. No other monoliths have been found since, and we don't know where these ones came from. We don't know if they were left behind by aliens or if it was some kind of elaborate hoax. If it was a hoax, it was pretty impressive to get all the monoliths in position around the globe within just days of each other. And for another matter, why had the first one been in the desert for so long? There's so many questions. Pluto's Gate Pluto's Gate was discovered in 2013 in the country of Turkey. This archaeological site exactly matches the description of a supposed temple leading to the underworld. This temple disappeared from the history books in the 6th century, but in ancient times had been viewed as a very literal portal to hell. As the Greek philosopher Strabo described it, this space is filled with a vapor so misty and dense that you can hardly see the ground. This place was creepy. As far as the story goes, tourists traveled from all across the ancient world to visit this temple and see for themselves the place where you could descend into oblivion. It was one of the biggest conspiracies in Greek-controlled territories 2,000 years ago. Tourists and pilgrims who arrived here, even if they were skeptical, left fully convinced that the underworld was real. When they came upon the gates, they could purchase a small bird or some other animal, like we might purchase a hot dog at a ball game. Then they let the animals loose at the gate, where the creature would immediately die. The only people who didn't die after crossing the threshold of the temple were the priests. The thing about Pluto's gate is that it's located directly above a crack in the ground. This fissure releases poisonous gas. When a small bird or other animal gets caught in the fumes, they immediately die. The only reason the priests were able to stand it for short periods was that they were incredibly high and hallucinating, but had grown somewhat used to it. The Alushis In Maya mythology, there is a tale about small humanoid creatures, kind of like goblins, who cause immense chaos. They are called the Alushis, or the Little People, and the conspiracy of these mischievous beings has been passed down for centuries. They cause destruction, mayhem, and trouble wherever they go. Believe it or not, some people still think these things are real. They allegedly live around the Yucatan Peninsula and are completely invisible to humans and can be found frolicking in the jungle and rooting around deep in caves. But of course, no one can actually see them. Not unless they wish to make themselves visible. And when they do, they look really bizarre. They have giant eyes like an owl, move quickly like a squirrel, and have various animal body parts. Pieces from a bird, parts of a deer, skin like an iguana, you know. They are exceptionally frightening figures and sometimes leer at people in the dark with their red eyes just to make them scared for fun. While these creatures are more of a superstition today, the Maya wholeheartedly believed in them. They were said to appear to travelers as they journeyed through the jungle. An Alux would often ask for an offering, and if the traveler refused, they would gather others of their kind and cause trouble for the traveler for the rest of their journey. Sometimes they would even make them sick and then bite them at night. The Super Dad 
You may have heard the strange claim that almost every person in the world is a descendant of the great Genghis Khan. Well, this isn't some kind of crazy conspiracy, and it's not an anecdotal piece of history. It's a very real thing, even if it is hard to believe. Genghis Khan was the ruler of the Mongol Empire between 1162 and 1227. He was a ruthless warrior famous for his sexual appetite. He sired so many children with so many different women, and he did it in so many places that he has countless descendants. A massive genetic study was done in 2013 and published in the science journal Nature. Researchers discovered that as many as 16 million living males are directly linked to the Mongolian ruler. So while that's not most people on the planet, it is a lot. National Geographic reports that nearly 8% of the men around the region of the former Mongol Empire have Y chromosomes that are nearly identical. Y chromosomes pass on chunks of DNA that rarely change over generations. Using random genetic markers, scientists can go back in time and trace them to when they first occurred, in this case, 1,000 years ago. What's really shocking is that the results weren't even a big surprise. The experts say this kind of thing has happened all throughout history. Powerful men often fathered children with as many women as possible to keep their lineage going. As the researchers said, this spread of patrilineage from father to son was by selection, not by chance. Genghis Khan was no exception. He had at least six wives and 500 concubines, which were all female rulers and royal family members of territories he had conquered, or gifts from allies and friends. And apparently, he made time for all of them. The Bear Lake Monster the Bear Lake Monster is a conspiracy of a different kind. The creature in question is rooted in Native American folklore, with its first modern sighting in 1868. These days, nobody knows if the monster in the lake is a conspiracy, maybe like the Loch Ness Monster, or a myth that refuses to die. What we know for sure is that the monster has been spotted in Bear Lake, near the Utah-Idaho border, for hundreds of years. The Native Americans first told stories of a great sea beast living in the lake before Europeans ever showed up, something they called a water devil. This thing is supposedly like a marine serpent, extraordinarily fast and unlike anything else living in the area. When the settlers came, they learned the stories from the Native Americans. But the myth kept on going, and in 1868, sightings of the creature leaked into the local Desert News newspaper. Swimmers were allegedly being abducted by this beast when they got too close to the water's edge. It actually scared the residents from wandering into its depths. People wouldn't camp near the lake, and it became a quietly agreed-upon danger zone. Maybe that was the plan all along, to keep people away. Over the next century and a half, sightings continued to come in sporadically. A man named Mike Havertz was one of the most recent people to claim that he saw the beast. He said that while he was out on a boat with some friends, a horrible monster, something he couldn't see very well because it was underneath the surface, went by quickly, creating waves nearly 20 feet high. Yet no matter how hard the experts search for this monster, it's never been found. So I wanted to give a big shout out to Becca and Mary Wisdom. We will definitely have some more Antarctica videos for you soon. Keep an eye out for a surprise. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. The Patsy Conspiracy the Patsy Conspiracy was a very real conspiracy by every definition. It was a secret plot by members of the wildly powerful Patsy family of Renaissance Florence to dispose of the Medici family, the rulers of Florence. It all started because of the Pope, the complex banking system, and a piece of land. Giovanni della Rovere, who had been appointed Prefect of Rome, wanted to purchase the small town of Imola. His plan was to create a new papal state. However, Lorenzo de' Medici, head of the wealthy Medici banking family, wanted to purchase the town for himself. When Giovanni went to purchase the town, hoping to use funds from the Medici bankers, they turned him down. And so he went to the Pazzi Bank. And in the end, Imola was out of Lorenzo's reach. What happened next is almost unbelievable. The Pazzi family got the Medici family out of their way for good and went to Pope Sixtus for approval. And while the Pope didn't technically sanction the assassination, he said it would be in everyone's interest if the Medici bankers were gone. The assassination was a total miss. They killed Lorenzo's brother on April 26, 1478, but Lorenzo survived, and he secured the Medici's power in Florence while banishing the Pazzi family forever. The Knights Templar 
The Order of the Knights Templar was founded on Christmas Day 1119 by Baldwin II, King of Jerusalem. What started as a group of French knights became an order of noble warriors protecting pilgrims in the Holy Land, and later on, an army of extraordinarily wealthy Christian militants who waged war against those who would threaten the Holy Land. They continued fighting until they were betrayed, slaughtered, and destroyed beyond repair in 1291. All these years later, the Knights Templar are still a source of major conspiracy theories. But what you might not know is that the conspiracy theories started a very long time ago, almost immediately after they were executed. In the 13th century, the German poet Wolfram von Eschenbach wrote a story about the Knights Templar being the guardians of the Holy Grail. This story has never gone away, even though it was probably just a tale told through a poem. And finally, it was the confessions tortured out of the Knights Templar by the minions of King Philip IV that made them infamous with the occult. They admitted to worshipping Baphomet, which inspired yet another tale in Henry Agrippa's 16th century book, De Oculta Philosophia. The story surrounding the purpose of the Knights Templar, their religious knowledge, secrets, and treasures track them all over the world, and they are given credit for everything from hiding the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia to bringing treasure to Oak Island in the United States. Great Tartaria the conspiracy theory of the ancient kingdom of Great Tartaria first showed up in Russia. It was Anatoly Fomenko who wrote a pseudo-historical conspiracy theory book called New Chronology. This was where the idea of Great Tartaria started, but it has since spiraled way out of control. Great Tartaria was a highly advanced civilization spread across the entire world, with its heartland being in Russia. Buildings like New York's Penn Station, the Singer Building, and even the grounds of the 1915's World Fair were all supposedly part of the Tartary Empire. Pretty much any Gilded Age building is said to be a remnant of this great empire. And just wait, because it gets even crazier. The theory says that a great flood of mud wiped out most of the ancient world prior to World War I. World War I and World War II were partially fought to help erase all evidence of the Tartary architecture still standing in Europe. These people believe that a great Russian empire already dominated the Earth centuries ago, building every major structure from the White House to the Pyramid of Giza. The theory is really the canon of architecture, according to Bloomberg's Zach Mortis. It's about as realistic as the Earth being flat. The Scottish Freemasons the Freemasons are a very real organization, one of the oldest and most widespread fraternities in the world. Members of the Freemasons have included names such as George Washington, Harry Houdini, Winston Churchill, and even Mormon founder Joseph Smith. And because these guys are so secretive, it's no surprise that they are at the center of quite a few conspiracy theories. The earliest known document of the Freemasons being wrapped up in some bizarre conspiracy comes from 1786. It was claimed that the Freemasons worked together with the Illuminati and the Order of Jesuits to form the New World Order. This order would discreetly manipulate world events into whatever the group saw fit. And here's a little juicy information. On the US $1 bill, the Latin phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum has been printed since 1935. The direct translation is New World Order. There is no definitive proof the Freemasons are behind every major event since the 1700s. However, there is no proof against it either. These guys have been around since the medieval days, originally formed as a group of Scottish stonemasons. So now conspiracy theorists are having a blast. The Vampire Carmilla if you were to ask who is the original vampire, most people would probably answer with Dracula. While the character of Dracula was probably inspired by Ivan the Terrible, there is a completely different story about vampires in old literature. Years before Dracula was ever written by Bram Stoker, there was another vampire story. Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu is the original vampire novelist. He wrote the novella Carmilla in 1871. His book was a first-person account given by a young Englishwoman named Laura who fell prey to the beautiful vampire Carmilla, another lady. In this original vampire tale, Carmilla and Laura fall into a steamy romantic relationship. The maidens in the nearby towns are afflicted by a strange illness. They all eventually die, and then Laura becomes sick. She also has a recurring nightmare that a giant cat is attacking her in the night. The giant cat turned out to be Carmilla, her lover, who is also a vampire. Carmilla is eventually hunted down, staked through the yard, decapitated, and then burned. It's a pretty gruesome story, and many argue that this was the original that influenced the legend of Dracula. 
But since Dracula was written in Victorian times, when society was seriously suppressed and held under extremely strict moral laws, it faded into obscurity and never got famous. But when Bram Stoker's account of a male vampire came out, it became an enormous success. The big difference was that Carmilla was a lady, having relations with another lady. That was enough to cover the story up for 145 years, while Dracula reigned as the world's first famous vampire, when in fact it was Carmilla. Thanks for watching! What's your favorite vampire story out there? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! See you next time! Bye!